want to welcome you to 1130 Wednesday Lunch and Bible Study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We're in our fourth lesson on a series called The Days of Noah. Jesus introduced us to this idea. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And I thought it would be, and that was in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, uh, which we have already studied and covered. I thought it would be of interest to us. We live in the days of the Son of Man, and we know that Noah's days is referred to as the last days because he was the generation of the flood. And the 120 days is known in the time of, in the days of Noah as the last days prior to the flood. I thought it would be of interest to us to maybe look at that and see what is it that we as Christians should be really concerned about the days of Noah for the days in which you and I live, the days of the Son of Man, prior to the second coming of Christ and the end of this post-Diluvian period. So I found that to be of interest, and so I'm sharing with you what I'm discovering that would be maybe relevant to us to know about. And so I'm in Genesis, the sixth chapter, over this series, I'll be looking at Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9. And I'm reading verses 1 through 4 today, and my subject matter is going to be, who were the sons of God? Because they played a very important role in these last days and the flood. Who were these sons of God? who married the daughters of men and produced a third race called the Nephilims, which in the Hebrew, by the way, the English word Nephilim is a Hebrew word. It's a noun, Nephilim, and the I am on the end of that word means it's plural, and the word Nephilim means fallen ones. It's from the Hebrew word Nephal. And it's used here, fallen ones. The Nephilims were the fallen ones. And we're not talking about the fallen ones of Adam. This was a completely different and separate race from the fallen ones of Adam. And they made up a third race in the antediluvian period, the period before the flood, an entire civilization. Well, here we are in uh, the sixth chapter. I'm going to read verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then we're going to discuss who were the sons of God and that produced a third race. It says, Now it came about when the men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. When men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful and they took them. That word took, we studied, means to seize forcibly, wise for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit, Holy Spirit, shall not strive with man forever. That gives us a clue how the Holy Spirit worked in the days of Noah. In fact, in the antediluvian period. Because he is flesh, nevertheless his days shall be 120 years. That's the period that we're talking about, the last days of the days of Noah. The Nephilims were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, speaking of the Nephilim. And I, we talked about that last week. Now we're going to, and we looked at who the Nephilim were, and we did a study on that. They're the only generation that didn't reproduce. They're the only generation, Nephilim, that did not have a biblical genealogy attached to them. That's really important. And that's already been studied. Now, today we're going to look at who are the sons of God 
that married the daughters of men and produced a race that couldn't produce, reproduce themselves called the Nephilims, the fallen ones, which is a key word. In the Hebrew, you always pay attention to these key words like that. Well, after a word of prayer, we're going to study this and try to get some clearance on what the Bible has to say about that. Does the Bible have anything to say about it? Yes, they do. The Bible has a great deal to say about it, and we'll look at it today. But in order to study the Bible in a proper manner, which means under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the church age believer interested in this subject because it deals with the last days of the Son of Man. <clears throat> you have to understand about something about the Bible in itself. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. That's a special word for the, the church age, new covenant believer. It's addressed in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Carnality as a Latin word means flesh, and it refers to the sin nature, operation in the life of a believer, discussed in Galatians 5, 16 and 17. And the evidence of carnality is personal sin. How do I know if I'm a carnal believer? Evidence is personal sin. How do I get out of carnality and back to spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit? I must confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. That cleansing is an important word. It goes back to verse 7 in 1 John 1 and refers to the blood of Christ on the cross. The believer in confession of sin comes back to the blood of, comes back to the cross of Christ where Jesus died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Not only for Adamic sin, but for personal sin. When I come to the cross of Jesus Christ as an unbeliever, it's about Adamic sin in Romans 5, 12 through 21. And I believe the gospel for my salvation. When I come as a believer in confession of my sin, I come back to the cross of Christ to confess that I have become carnal, that I have, I have chosen my self-pleasure, the lust of gratification of the sin nature over the will of God in my life, over the lust of the Spirit of God to do the things of God. I come back to the cross, I confess, and I am cleansed, not for salvation, but for sanctification. To return me to the, to restore me to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is an enormous issue in the church age. If I walk in the Spirit, I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, personal sin. And when I do, then I come back, I confess my sin, I am forgiven through the cross, I am forgiven, and I am restored to sanctification or the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit which is a key according to Jesus because in John 14, 25, 26, 27 in that passage, he says that the Holy Spirit will teach and recall the word of God. So let's take a moment to do that and then we'll get into this study. Who were the sons of God in the days of Noah? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way uh, to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God about this to us as we examine the Scriptures to determine who were these because they were, they were instrumental in the destruction, the Nephilims, of the antediluvian civilization. And there are things that we need to be aware of in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... Today we're going to look at the subject matter under the following four points about who were the sons of God who married the daughters of men who produced this unusual race of people during the antediluvian period that caused the fall of the civilization and divine judgment upon it, the flood. Who were these people? Well, I introduced them last week to you. You will need that study to be involved in this study. You're, you're going to have to learn that when we study this, we are studying one right after another of revealing to you what this means from 
this jet, that's the antediluvian civilization. You and I live in the post-diluvian civilization. And what we learn from them is going to be very important. So I want you to be aware of that. For point number one is the, that the, the, the book of Jonah, uh, the, uh, the book of Genesis talking about Jonah is paralleled in the book of Job, believe it or not, in the book of Job. Now, these two books parallel each other in biblical history. And uh, most people with a study Bible who do research on this kind of stuff know that. Your, your pastor would know that. The, the book of Job and the book of Genesis are going to talk about this in very similar terms to help us understand who were the sons of God that married the daughters of men that produced a race that could not reproduce itself, produced a generation of males. Who were they? And we talked about that last week now. This is just further information uh, to, to try to make sure you have a clearer picture of the word of God. So these two books, they talk about the sons of God, and both of them identify the sons of God as angels. Angels. Angels, they both identify that these were angels that had fallen, where we get the name Naphol and Nephilim, that had fallen along with Satan in Job he presents him as being able to come before the throne of God. In Job 1 and 2, if you study that, you will see that Satan and the sons of God he came before the throne of God to make a request or a charge, a request charge, against certain believers. So we find that of interest. This is Satan. This is Satan along with one-third of of the angels, the elect angels, the, the regular elect angels, the, before the fall of Satan. This is Satan who, when he revolted in eternity past against God and God's will and his plan, led a third of the angels in a revol revolution against God. They revolted against God. And they became the fallen angels. We refer to two, set, two classifications of angels in the Bible. Fallen angels that followed Satan and elect angels who stayed and followed God. And we know this from Isaiah 28, 11 through 19, which you should study. And Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. And Revelation that discuss this in Revelation 12, 3, to, 3 through 12. Revelation 12, 3 through 12. The, it is the book of Job. It is the book of Job that brings much of this out, as well as Genesis. In Job 1, 6, for example, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came along with them. That's Job 1.6. You're going to find the same thing said in Job 2.1. Now listen to me. And in Job 38.7. So there is evidence out of the book of Job, a parallel book with Genesis, that the sons of God were the fallen angels that followed Satan. That's what we believe about this. New Testament believers under the church age, the post-Diluvian period, New Covenant church age believers, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be of a sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary the devil Another term of de another descriptive term of Satan, the, your adversary, the devil, prowls around 
like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We know from Genesis, the 20th chapter, in a descriptive title of Satan, he's described as Satan, the old serpent, the devil, the evil one. All descriptive terms of him. Point number two. So we have, do, is there some evidence in the Bible? A parallel book is Job. Job 1, Job 2, Job 38. Discuss this very issue. Who were these sons of God? Isaiah 28, uh, Ezekiel 28, and Isaiah 14 give us a clue to eternity of, into eternity past of the fall of Satan. Here's point number two. I'm just looking for evidence. I, like you, want to know, what is this about? What, how is this working? Peter, point number two, Peter, Jude, and John, in their writings, Peter wrote two books, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Jude, Jude wrote a book. And John, John wrote five. He was a writer of Revelation. These, these men, Peter, Jude, John, all taught that these sons of God in Genesis 6, that these sons of God were fallen angels under the leadership of Satan during the last days of Noah. We find this recorded in 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, Tartarus, that's an angelic prison, and committed them to pits, in the Greek that's, that's caverns or spaces of utter darkness, reserved for judgment, in angelic prison, awaiting judgment, divine judgment, and did not spare, and he puts, the, he puts them together, and did not spare the ancient world, that's the antediluvian civilization, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, In the flood, these angels and Nephilims, the fallen ones and the fallen ones, were put in Tartarus, the angelic prison in the heart of the earth. Revelation 9 1 through 13 calls this place the abyss and bottomless pit. Gen Revelation 9 records that the ruler or the lead, the, the, the captain of the army of the sons of God who attacked the seed of Christ, the genealogy of Genesis 3.15. We know his name. His name is recorded. In the Hebrew, his name is Abaddon, A-B-A-D-D-O-N. He was the ruler, the lead dog, the, the commanding general of this attack. Uh, 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 of the Nephilims upon the, ge the genetic seed, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You got a pencil and paper now, haven't you? Huh? I've stirred your interest, haven't I? And I should. Revelation 9, 1 through 13. Now listen to me. He's identified as the ruler of this group. In other words, the commanding general of this attack. 
it's identified in Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. When Paul, when Paul identifies Satan and, the, and his fallen angels and describes them in military terms, he calls them rulers and powers and wickedness. Well, you all should go, read, go and read that. This man that's described in Revelation 9, 1 through 13, would be known in that group. There's four, four divisions. Satan has four divisions of military in the angelic conflict. One of them would be ruler, and that's who that man was. The ruler, Abaddon, Abaddon, the ruler of that attack. Just, uh, here's my point. What's the Bible say? I am telling you what the Bible says. In Jude 6, and angels who did not keep their own dominion, own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. For judgment. Who, who, who are these angels and where are they kept? We know. They're the fallen angels that were involved in, not all of them, but enough of them, the, the ruler section of the division. We even know the guy that we know, the head ruler. We know his name. <laughs> Listen, Jesus was in an encounter with a demoniac living in a graveyard, chained up and all that. You know the story. And Jesus commanded him, got in a conversation with the, with the, 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 the demonic leader. And Jesus demanded that he tell him who he was. And you know what he called himself? Legions. A military term. A, Ro a Roman military identity of a legion that's part of that ruler deal. I don't know. You know, I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. How about this one? First Peter, remember I said, I said, Peter, Jude, John, here I am. First Peter 3, 18 through 20. First Peter, <laughs> I know you're getting interested now, and I love that. First Peter 3, 18 through 20. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In such spirit also, he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. You know who that is? Fallen angels involved in Genesis 6. They're in an angelic prison to Tarsus. It has other names, but that's the official name. Who once were, oh, you say, how do you know it? Well, listen. Who once were disobedient with the patience of God waited in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, last days, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the floodwaters. Add Hebrews 11, 7 to that. If you, like me, have lived long enough to hear what cliches or things that people say about things, I used to hear people say, I still do, by the way, there must be a special place in hell for these kind of people. There is. <laughs> There is for these angels, these fallen angels involved 
in this revolt against the messianic seed of Genesis 3.15. And that place is called the Tarsus. T-A-R, T-A-R-U-S. Point number three. See, I'm telling you what the Bible says. I ain't telling you what Ron Adam thinks. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I've quoted Peter, Jude, John. These sons of God and their sons, the Nephilims, the fallen ones, the sons of God, the fallen ones, are producing fallen ones called the Nephilims, will suffer the same divine judgment as the fallen angels in 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5, which we've already read. And what will that judgment be? Matthew 25, 41. In Matthew 25, uh, 41, Jesus enters this discussion like he did in Matthew 24, 37, and 39 when he said, hey, guy, go look at the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Here's what he said about the judgment day. They were all worried about the judgment day. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20, John, t Revelation 20, 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the keys of the abyss, angelic prison, and a great chain in his hand. In other words, he had the power to release. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He had the power to put him in prison, and he has the power to take him out. Bound him for a thousand years. We refer to that as the millennial age. That's why we're in Matthew 20 talking about it. Here is that reference to legions. Matthew 8, 29. Jesus in this confrontation with this demoniac. And they cried out and they said, what business do we have with each other. What business do I have with you, Jesus, that you're on my territory messing with the man I'm in? Listen to what they said. That was the first thing they said. Listen to the second thing they said. Have you come here to tor uh, torment us before the time? Isn't that interesting? I mean, they got to they gotta watch. They pay attention to the time because there's a time coming when they're going to be cast in a lake of fire. I mean, they're, they're smarter than a lot of us. You ought to read that. You can read more about it in Luke 8. Luke 8. It's in Luke 8.30 that the, Jesus says, what's your name? I, I demand your name. He says legion. Legion. Here's point number four in closing. Oh, I know you're going to have study on your own. I mean, I, geez. I'm giving you quite a bit of information here today. I know you didn't get enough notes and you want me to go back and repeat everything. I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. But what I will do At doctrinalstudies.com, you click on Days of Noah, you'll be able to pick up the notes because we do want you to learn. And a great team of guys under John Dyer are sure that this is done on your behalf so that you miss nothing. And you should be, you should be, you should be in prayer for that that group and that ministry that you're receiving off the internet. They need your prayers and you need the information. Point number four. During the church age period of the post-Diluvian civilization, fallen angels are referred to as demons in Matthew 12, 22 through 39 as an example. 
I know. Matthew 12, 22 through 39, they're sometimes they're referred to demons. Depends on what they're doing. Sometimes they're called unclean spirits, like in Matthew 12, 43 and 45. And sometimes they're called evil spirits. Acts 19, 13. That's the angelic, that's the fallen angels in warfare against the church because they lost a large segment of their military in the flood where they were put in Tartarus. We battle the rest of them. <laughs> we battle the rest of them. They're demons, they're unclean spirits, they're evil spirits. They have to, they have to indwell some object to have existence because they're disembodied spirits. They cannot do ever again what they did in the days of Noah. They have to fight a different type of warfare with us in the, in the post-Diluvian period. They can never do that again. They can never, they, for example, they can never indwell a believer's life because the Holy Spirit does. First John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I mean, the Spirit of God that lives in you is greater than Satan and the whole, the whole group. You do know that, don't you, beloved? Jesus, Paul, and John taught that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was superior to Satan. You should read 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. We are superior to angel. You should read the book of Hebrews. We are superior. An unbeliever is inferior, and a believer is superior because of his redemptive salvation through the, through the second member that God had God the Son, and because the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, dwells inside the, your body, our body. We will one day judge angels. We are superior in Christ, not in ourselves, but in Christ. We're superior to the angelic classification. They all taught this. For example, in Matthew, the 12th chapter, 28, Jesus said, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. They, they, they were the enemy, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, were charging him to be El Elzebub, a hierarchy in Satan's army because he could command the demons to do things and they would do it. <laughs> he says, you're nuttier than a fruitcake. That's my interpretation of it. He said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God, it's proof that the kingdom of God is upon you. <laughs> oh, Paul said, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Not a mystery to you and I that there's a warfare called the angelic conflict. For the, but there is to other people who are not taught. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only, who, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. You know who that is? That's the redeemed of God in the post-Diluvian period in the church age. It's called the church age believers. Indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And when that church age believer group called the church is removed from the earth by the rapture is what he's talking about. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, tribulational time, 
whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. He's talking about the rapture of the church described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. John, 1 John 4, 4, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Talking about the Holy Spirit in you is greater than Satan in the world. You should read 1 John 3, 24. You should read 1 John 14, 16, and 17. John 14, 16, and 17. It says, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will take up residence within you, and he will remain there forever. You should read 1 John 5, 19, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, which is Satan. The God of this world with a little g. That's who he thinks he is. Therefore, the Nephilims and the sons of God are not classified under Adam's original sin. Romans 5, 12 through 25 or 21 does not apply to them. They do not have a human biblical genealogy they couldn't reproduce. The Nephilims couldn't reproduce. The Nephilims are fallen ones classified with the sons of God as the fallen angels and are classified under the same divine judgment. Their divine judgment of Satan and his followers or angels, like in Matthew 25, 41, Mark 1, 23 through 28, Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 9, 20th chapter, verse 10, Revelation 20, 10. Let's take a look at that, because I'm going to get back to talk about the days of Noah next time. Revelation 20.10, and the devil who deceived them, this is, if you read verse 7, when a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison, and then will come his judgment. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then will come the great white throne judgment of, of unbelievers. Revelation 20, 15 through 15, uh, 11 through 15. Listen to verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire was originally designed in the, for the final judgment of the fallen angels. But men who follow him to their utter destructive end, who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, who is a sinner, one under Adamic sin, born a human After the genealogy of Adam, the first Adam, born again under the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, born again under the last Adam with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. His name, their names are written in the book of life. But those who reject that message of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Name not found written in the book of life is because you've refused to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. For if you believe that, your name will be recorded in the book of life, and it will be important in your final day of judgment. 
I implore you to believe and be saved. Believe and receive. We live in the last days, and judgment is certain to come as it was in the days of Noah. This is no time to foolish with your destiny. Today is the day of salvation. Behold, this is the acceptable day. I plead with you to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and find the abundant life here and now and later. For as sure as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of some, there will be a judgment coming. And the final judgment will be the lake of fire. It was not prepared for you. You don't have to go there. But if you reject the gospel and follow the other God of this world, your destiny and final abode will be the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Dear hearts, you gamble with your own destiny. Do not do that. Only a fool says in, says in his heart, there is no God. God would certainly not do that. He said he would. If you reject the message of grace, if you don't get in the ark, which is the grace way out. The only way you get in the ark is through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I plead with you to do that today. Not tomorrow. Today. Tell the Father, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. I believe that for my salvation. It's done. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. At least the boast go to you. The boast goes to God. Saves you by grace. It's a gift. Let's pray. Father, I pray for these today that have heard this message and the plea at the end, the appeal. What must I do to be saved? The jailer asked. Believe that Jesus came into this world to die for your sins, to release you from the penalty of Adamic sin, to justify you always in the presence of God, to transfer you into the kingdom of God where your name is written in the book of life forever, to give you a victorious life in time and forever. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Believe it. And state that belief to the Father tonight. Before you go to bed tonight, call somebody and tell them you did it. Get your Bible and begin to study with us the truth of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.